start. So welcome everybody. We are 12 people right now. I hope more people join us in the coming minutes. And uh, you can see we are in this uh, paper session. It's the 10th session of the conference. And it's going to last from uh, 7.15. 8.45, but remember, it says time, because you are in many, many parts of the world. So we are going to see different uh, application of uh, metadata in different domains. So the first, well, I'm going to, you have here the, the, the title of the presentations. We have three presentations. We have four speakers and the second presentation is going to be a video, but you will you have the, them here to ask. And at the end, we will have uh, like four or five minutes to uh, post some questions or comments or whatever. So I'm going to stop after each presentation and ask, ask for comments. You have the chat, you remember, you have the chat to make any comments during the session. So the first is Ines, Ines Lopez from Portugal. I have here the information she published for the conference and she's from the University of Minho. Uh, this paper, she's presenting a paper she made for a master thesis. And I would like to know later if you are working on a PhD already or not. And now, <laughs> okay. So not yet. Pretty, not yet. Okay, but maybe. So you're going to present a linked open data solution for a domain, very political domain, for interest of the politicians and then the public procurement procurement database. So I'm really eager to know more about. So I stopped my presentation and now you are on the floor. Well, thank you, Gemma, for the lovely introduction. Introduction. I'm go. I'm starting to share my screen. If someone can just let me know that they are seeing the slide full screen, that would be great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Perfect. So, oh, it's in the closing note exactly what we wanted. So let's just forward back to the beginning. <laughs> So, uh, like Gemma lovely introduced this uh, project, I'm going to introduce its part of what I did for my master thesis. It's called Map for Scrutiny, and it's a linked open data solution for politicians' interest registers. I'm going to focus a bit more on the actual linked data planning, application profile, and implementation. But before that, I'm going to also give a bit of feedback and a big uh, foreground on where the data came from, why, and a bit of the challenges of the pre-processing. So imagine the very, you know, colloquially question that anyone can make in a coffee conversation of how much did companies owned by parliamentarians made from public procurement in, for instance, 2019? And it sounds simple enough, but at least in Portugal, where I live and where the data from this project is focused, uh, to answer this question, I would have to go into the these two websites. So go into the parliament.pt, which is a public website with data on the interest registers of all the politicians. And I would have to check one by one where uh, they work or where they still work that's not the government. And then I would have to look up all of these resources on the public procurement website and see if anything pops up and if contracts do pop up, then how much they were worth and if they are from 2019, sum it all up. And this is a lot of work to answer a simple question. And since these two databases are actually both governmental based, uh, then the idea came that, hey, why not take the fact that they even have um, a resource here in common, so in this case the organizations, the enterprises, and try to take data from here and make it into linked open data. And that's exactly what this project is about. So the interest registers, they are all in HTML. And the public contracts, they are all in CSV. And the idea is very simple, taking this two part of these two data sets and transforming them into linked open data. And how did that then came to be? In a bit more, specifying a bit more the goals of the project, uh, at the end, it would have to be a machine readable format. 
uh, it would have to be linked to each other. So both databases, but also to other external load vocabularies and controlled vocabularies uh, would be implemented in a triple store with the Sparkle endpoint and the whole process, which is what I'm going to talk a bit more about today, uh, would have to be transparent. So um, the tools used a lot uh, was used during the project, but for the main parts, I'm going to talk a little bit about OpenRefine, which is this very user-friendly tool to transform mainly from uh, tabular data into uh, RDF. Then there was some Python scrapping involved just to retrieve the data from the original sources and then to transform them into CSV so they could be handled in OpenRefine. Uh, I'm sorry, ships expressions written in Shex Compact were used for validation and also to have some documentation on the application profile. Uh, everything, all the data is parsed in RDF Turtle and uh, the application profile used to describe the data is Dublin Core application profile. So there were three steps. I'm going to be a bit uh, shorter on the first one, source cleaning and uniformizing the data to prepare it for the actual transformation designing the linked data profile and actually transforming the data, validating it and publishing it. So for the first part, like I said, there are two uh, databases, Parliament 2.0 and Baz.gov. So here uh, where we got information on the interest registers and on the right where we got the information on the contracts. And here in the first line, there's going to be things that were handled by the scrapper. And on the second line, there's going to be things that were handled by OpenRefine. And this looks uh, a bit like overkill and too much, but I'm going to break it down so it's easier to explain. First step, retrieving all the interest registers, doing some cleaning and uniformization, appending some bibliographical data that was available also on the same website. And this was all done very easily with OpenRefine. And then with all this data, so it was saved into uh, a CSV ready to be transformed, but the names of the entities were then feeding a second scrapper. And this second scrapper, these are just to print for illustration of what the actual code in the back looked like. This second scrapper was then going into the, the buzz.gov website and looking for all the names of the companies getting all the contracts in which they were involved and the same thing happened. So everything was cleaned. What we see here is an example of cleaning some strings in which things have. So what you see in the beginning is a non-appliable and what you see in the bottom is the same, but in Portuguese. So this kind of cleaning up that would then make mapping in, into RDF a lot easier was done also a lot with the aid of OpenRefine. Then already in buzz.gov, all the names were, uh, were looked up and from 725 organizations mentioned in the interest registers, 246 were found to have to be involved in contracts, either as suppliers or as contractors. So all of that was extracted. And then once again, cleaning and uniformization, way easier than with the previous data set and everything saved up nice and neat neatly in a CSV ready to then be transformed. So yeah, that was pretty much the, um, the sourcing phase. This is just some extra steps to get some extra data that was also available on buzz.gov on the companies like addresses and the unique fiscal identifier. So then the more interesting part, which was designing the linked data profile, having the data and having done all the pre-processing and having more knowledge on what the data looked like, it was time to decide how is this going to be described as linked data. And so first thing was to define all the local properties, of course, and list them. And then for all of these properties and to be classes and values, everything was looked up in using love, linked open vocabularies, using also Google and also going through more known ontologies to try to see what was the best way to describe all of this data. There was a bit of trial and error here and probably a really challenging part because uh, it was a matter of trying to balance 
uh, if this was going to be highly descriptive or if it was going to be more flexible. And I'm going to explain a bit more on why this decision was a big part of the work later on. So here, quite simple, if something suitable was found, it was added to this constraint matrix, which was this internal document that preceded a more formal uh, application profile. And if not, then it would be created. And here, we can see an example of some properties and classes that had to be created and also some vocabulary, some controlled vocabularies that were created for values where it was suitable. So, for instance, for uh, describing the types of contracts or for describing marital status, these are things that can be in a vocabulary because they are set. There's a few number of values that can exist there and they have a very specific description. It cannot be just any string. And here we can already see a thing, which is the use of schema and the schema domain includes and range includes instead of your standard RDF as domain and range. And the reason why this was selected was for flexibility. So because what is being described here can easily be reused, these are public entities and also known enterprises, it was... It, it was decided that it was more important to use a vocabulary like schema.org that would be highly flexible and therefore would provide um, easier to integrate final data set than to, for instance, describe our organizations, which there was not a lot of data about with a more complete, uh, for instance, organization ontology. So doing this, then uh, this is a very small uh, preview of what it looked like in the end. The contracts are linked to the organizations by the fact that they are either the organizations are a supplier or a contracting authority. The parliamentarians were a member of this organization and there's also some extra information on the contracts for modifications or changes. Uh, something else that's important to mention here is this reified statement. So for the parliamentarian uh, member of organization triple, there's more information in BABAP here. There was also information about member of, but what kind of role and when did it start and when did it end? And the choice here was to go with an RDF vocabulary reified statement. So a blank note that is also of the type schema role to um, illustrate better this connection here. So according to the reified statement vocabulary, it has an object, a predicate, which is the property and uh, a subject, and it then has further information. So the bigger picture with everything that was also described is here. And here we can already, I'm just going to point out a few things like the use of the taxonomy for geographical names uh, as a, a controlled vocabulary for geographical locations. There's also here in the parliamentarian in the occupations, the ESCO vocabulary, which is a European vocabulary, um, European taxonomy that was available only in, or at least was only found as a JSON file and not in RDF, but it was easily converted to SCOSH with, once again, open refine. And there's some more uses here, like for the main object of the contract, there's already the controlled procurement, the, sorry, the controlled uh, vocabulary for public procurement codes, which was then used to describe the contracts. And going a bit further into this, the way that it was more officially described, the previous image was just for visual aids to do an overall explanation. But the reason also, which is something I wanted to explore a bit, why both DCAP and Shex were used is because they were useful for very different things. So Shex was obviously used for validation, but also as documentation of the shapes. But something more tabular like the cap is extremely useful if you are in a meeting describing how the descriptions are evolving, if you are trying to see what could be a better used. This is way more friendly, especially to create a discussion and the conversation over the, um, the application profile than something like Shex is when you're also, you're always going up and down trying to see where the descriptions are and how they link. So that's why, uh, and because it was a research project also, that's why both uh, implementations were used to describe the shapes and to describe the application profile. 
then actually doing the the work so putting together what was planned with the data that was already pre-processed there's the transforming validation and publishing phase so we are back in open refine with all of the csvs and we have the plan that was very well structured in the application profile first thing that was done was reconciling the values and reconciling the values is this very neat open refine feature where literally you go there you click in a column and you say that all the strings you say <laughs> that all the strings in that column you want to uh, compare them to this specific control vocabulary and it's going to match them for you and then you just have to do a double check so it's a semi-automatic process and this was used for every controlled vocabulary that was used in the application profile then uh, the second part was manually mapping out the properties to the columns so it's something that looks a bit like what we are seeing now there's this, I'm going to say that this column is the IRI for the parliamentarian, then it's linked to this other column by screen and description. And then you, we cannot see it here, but this third part also says whether this value is of type string, of type IRI or anything else. And then in the end, just one click away, it's going to generate for us a very nice, in this case, RDF turtle data uh, already parsed so that it can be uploaded in a first validated and then uploaded in a triple store. So talking about the validation, after exporting all this data, it was all parsed with a simple command line tool against the check shapes. And this is something like this. You just pass a shape map, which says that this shape for this entity here is going to be compared to the expected shape of an organization because this is an organization. And then the tool is going to provide um, back a Boolean information on whether this is or not conformant to the, the expected shape. And in this specific case, two things can happen. Either it is a mapping or a transformation error. And when that was spotted, then it was corrected and then back into the loop. And if it was missing mandatory data, then it was excluded and not uploaded in the triple store. And what was considered mostly mandatory data that created exclusions in this case were 10 reified roles that did not, did not have so then reified statements that did not have any information for a role. And so it was deemed that it made no sense to create a reified statement, just replicating what the triple already says. And uh, a number of contracts that did not have a supplier, and it was considered the minimum to describe a contract to say who bought it and who supplied for it. And because it is a public contract, also contracts without the common procurement code were also eliminated because that's an important part of a public contract and it should be considered mandatory data. So basically, after all of this was done, everything that passed validation was uploaded into a triple store and all the parliamentarians, all the organizations, contracts, roles, and the contract modifications and extinctions. Then there was also the value vocabularies because this was this is not yet in a um, public access endpoint. So all the vocabularies, it's not online. So all the vocabularies were also uploaded in the local instance of the, um, of the triple store. So the new properties, uh, the new values, the European occupations taxonomy, and then the reused uh, taxonomy geographical locations and common procurement vocabulary. Then uh, just to wrap it up a bit, some Sparkle queries are also ran on the data. This first one, for instance, is the roles the parliamentarians have in each organization. And even though this is not even putting together both databases, just the fact that now it can be queried with Sparkle is already an improvement over what was there before, because this data, as I mentioned, was single HTML pages. Another example we have here is a query result for the price of contracts supplied by organizations owned by parliamentarians. And here we have just some examples of how much these contracts costed, uh, who provided for them, and what person is actually an owner of this organization that was a provider, and how much do they own. Uh, and then to go back to the very colloquial 
coffee conversation question I made in the beginning, what if we actually wanted to know uh, what uh, was the amount of money made by public contracts in public contracts by uh, organizations owned by parliamentarians in 2019. So it turns out that actually there was only one contract that made 14,000 euros. Uh, if we go back to another year, then the answer will be different. For instance, in 2020, there was none. But the big goal here was the, the question is just an example and the big goal here was to make it possible to quickly find out the answer to something like that and to quickly compare data about the things that are of the public interest and are widely discussed. So to wrap up a bit of the work done here, it was extremely interesting to document the whole process of going from an idea and two separate databases to then um, a linked open data transformation. The most of the challenges were really connected to the quality of the data and a lot of it went came through in the pre-processing. Nevertheless, some goals, most of them were achieved with the exception of having the data already in an online endpoint that's still to be done. And a lot of contributes were also done and they are all publicly available and can be used also as an example to other uh, small projects that anyone might want to run or to try a little bit with transforming data sets from tabular to linked open data. So there's everything there, the validated data, the validation outputs, the scrapping code, application profiles, checks, vocabularies, everything. And then some ideas for the future of improving what is already there, making it automated, all of the cleaning so that it could be something that would update, for instance, every time there's new uh, interests uh, registers or every time there's new contracts and even broadening the data scope a little bit. So that was it for the summary of the Map for Scrutiny paper. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to ask them. Okay, thank you. Go to the next. Yep. Okay. You keep, stay here. And maybe yeah, there, are, there will be more questions at the end. Thank so, you. Yeah, I'm going to share a little bit just to now we have the the presentation from Xiaomi Ma and Chelsea Dinsmore. They are here, but they are going to play a video and they they are going to explain us how to implement machine aided indexing in an academic library. They both work for an academic library at the University of Florida. And the name of the library is Church of. I am Smathers, it's a complicated one. So let's see who has the video to, to stop it. I stop my, my presentation. I'll share the video. Okay, do you have it? So here. Okay. And shut up. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? And I'm going to play. Hopefully the sound will come out. It should. Okay, I'm going to play. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation on Finding Florida, Implementing Machine-Aided Indexing in an Academic Library. I'm Chelsea Dinsmore. I'm the Chair of Resource Description Services with the University of Florida Libraries. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jali Ma, the Metadata Librarian and Head of the Metadata Unit, also in the Resource Description Services with the George A. Smathers Libraries at the University of Florida. The UF Digital Collections officially began in 2006. <clears throat> These digitalized collections were well supported as a library priority which meant that when combined with our collection of born digital content, the UF Digital Collections grew at an extraordinary speed over the last dozen or more years. As a result, the libraries faced the very real challenge of describing incoming content in a quick and accurate manner. 
Next slide, please. As a public land grant university, UF has extensive interests and large holdings in the area of Florida history and heritage. This is demonstrated in our online collections where you will find Florida citrus labels, maps and blueprints of Florida heritage sites, various Florida political and scholarly papers, historical and modern Florida agricultural research materials, and an extensive collection of dissertations and research materials uh, written by University of Florida graduate students. Some of these materials are clearly about Florida, but some of them it's a lot harder to tell. When asked to develop an online portal dedicated to gathering Florida-specific content found within the broader UFDC collections, the digital collections team was a bit flummoxed. Without knowing the quantity of the target group and having no consistent descriptive information about named places, finding Florida in the UF digital collections seemed as daunting as looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack. A library team determined that identifying named places in Florida and adding that information using local controlled vocabulary subject headings in the metadata should create a searchable data point. There was pushback. We were asked if the team expected someone to actually read through all of the content looking for references to Florida localities. Well, the team replied, surely there's a way to have a computer do that. We know there are systems that review text for targeted words in order to identify subjects to use. We couldn't find reference to other libraries running a project like that, so our dean suggested that we look at publishers and think in terms of indexing tools. Next slide, please. And that is how we came to the idea of testing the implementation of a machine-aided indexing system to improve the discoverability of our digital collection content. Under the leadership of the library's Associate Dean for Discovery, Digital Services, and Shared Collections, the libraries formed an implementation group of eight members from three different library departments. And now I'm going to turn this over to Jali to explain the process that we developed and used to implement this pilot project. Thank you, Chelsea. Machine-Aided Indexing MAI. We worked with Access Innovations. It is an experienced subject index service and product provider. We also developed a series of applications to integrate access innovations technology with the local infrastructure. Our MAI approach uses machines to locate target terms from taxonomies and then count their appearance in the text files. Based on the count and the preset logic, MAI assigns subjects to items. This process yields fast and consistent results. Let's take a closer look at of this process. We used access innovations technology at two places. One is here, Maestro here. The other is Get Suggested Term API. Um, Maestro provides us the environment to gather the terms, organize the terms, and do the rule building and test the MAI result with single files. And also, this piece gets suggested term API allows us to do the MAI work by batch, which is 1,000 items a time. So we build this taxonomy and then uh, store the terms here on Access Innovations server. And this suggest term API allows us to retrieve the term from their server, and we have the local piece to pull in the text file from UF Digital Collection, and then we do the batch process. Another local piece will gather and display MAI results, then taxonomist will review the uh, results. We identify all sorts of issues in this review process. If it is term or rule related issues, well, this will trigger new rounds of gathering terms, to, uh, modify the rules, which is like the preset logic, um, giving to the machine to decide the subject. So there will be some reiteration here. And if it is other issues will come as a team to decide using the best resource to solve the issues. Um, after we feel happy with the MAI results, we'll write those selected terms to the UF Digital Collection XMLs. Then we have a local piece to pull out the XMLs from the digital collection and update the XML and send um, by batch, also copy paste the XML to the folders where the UF digital collection will pull in and update its website. 
um, let's look at our challenges. The first challenge is related to OCR, optical character recognition. This technology converts the images into machine-readable text. However, due to all kinds of con uh, conditions, the um, text file quality produced by OCR process may not meet the needs of the MAI. For instance, the original scan was poor, then there's no better OCR text for the MAI process to use. The silicon challenge comes from the noise. That means the concepts that appear often but don't contribute to the theme. In the review process, we noticed that a main source of noise is a bibliography list reference, usually at the end of the text files. So um, we tracked this issue and concluded it affects 9% of the reviewed items. We then added the scripts to our local application to remove the last 5% of the text file. That it was a success. We resolved this problem. And another challenges we had listed here is the gaps in the concept. So we also depend on the review process to identify these gaps. Um, so when key concept missing from the taxonomy, the MAI result won't be good. But the difficult part is to identify the gaps. Okay, now let me turn the mic back to Chelsea. She will um, uh, summarize our year's experience with MAI. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, so in conclusion, implementing MAI locally allowed the library to run this new process in parallel with other daily tasks. One outcome of the team's three years effort is the Florida specific taxonomy, Florida Geo. This taxonomy has been registered with the Library of Congress as a known authority file. Working with MAI, the team identified over 17,000 items that were about named places in Florida, representing approximately 23% of English language single volume content in UFDC. These items are now tagged with the Florida place names as geographic subjects. Most of these access points were not available prior to this process. The project involved a great deal of staff time devoted to creating the Florida Geothea thesaurus building rules within the software for their application, and then refining the rules via an iterative process. As the audience can only imagine, this was a lengthy, time-consuming, and expensive process. Total build costs for the software subscriptions, training time, and consultations exceeded $300,000 over five years, and the authors have not been able to calculate the total cost of staff hours needed to actually bring this project to fruition. However, before the project ended, the team determined that the automated results were acceptably accurate for use in serving the needs of our digital collections user, users. So the system worked as expected, and the project could be said called a success. Um, the authors would like to acknowledge the contributions of Robert Phillips, a close colleague who made several critical contributions to the programming side of the pilot project. Robert passed away during the later stages of the effort, but without his contributions earlier on, this project would not have completed successfully. So if anyone has questions, we will do our best to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, you both. Let's see, well, it ate my time. Uh, we can pass to the next, but stay here so now we have lee lee young yeah from wisconsin milwaukee she's going to talk about something completely different another domain about robin that i have to look for what that was because i didn't know nothing about that so I really would like to know what happens with Robin's metadata. Lee, is your time? I set up, I stopped my presentation. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, do you see it? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Jim, for introducing me. 
Um, today, I'm going to present an overview of the comparative study of Robin's metadata scans. Robin is, has been a universal print technology for centuries to preserve and disseminate cultures across countries, for example, in China, Germany, and Japan, the UK, etc. Um, in China, the evidence shows that the earliest robins can be dated to, dated to Tang Dynasty um, from 618 to 907 AD. In the UK, brass monuments first appeared um, around the 13th century and brass robins were introduced at a later time. Here are two examples of Chinese robin and brass robin. Um, the original objects of robins can be anything with a hard surface used to record texts, images, or drawings, including coins, bricks, roof tiles, ceramics, and stela, tombstones, pillars, cliffs, rocks, vessels, oracle bones, etc. Robins are of high value to studying history and art. Here we have four examples um, to show. Uh, you can see from this, uh, on these objects, uh, there are inscriptions. The inscriptions are commonly canonical texts, institutions and regulations, military campaign and victories, eulogies, personal life stories, local events, temple construction, patronage and mythologies. The drawings and the designs are commonly dresses, costumes, military effigies, architectures, armories, religious figures, auspicious signs and motifs like dragons, flowers, and clouds. Cataloging robins exists for a long time. In China, cataloging epigraphs and robins arose in Northern Song Dynasty and revived in Qing Dynasty. The earliest known Chinese robins catalogs are Ji Gu Lu and Jing Shi Lu. In the West, several catalogs of brasses appeared in the 19th century. Um, for example, a manual of monument brasses and a series of monument brasses are the very famous catalogs of um, brass robins. Uh, digitization has been a mainstream practice of ancient objects in libraries and museums in the information era. Digitization of robins allows robins to be more open to the public, making them reach a wider range of patrons, facilitates research in relevant fields and be preserved for a long time. Um, especially for the rare robins, uh, the molded robins, deteriorated robins or the robins which could not be borrowed or exhibited. Many libraries and museums have digital open robin collections. There are some e examples. The Chinese robins collections of the Field Museum and Harvard Library. The brass robins collections of Hamline University and the Spurlock Museum. Each project exhibits the robins in different structures and with various levels of detail. Mm, along with the trend of digitization, structured metadata schemes of robins have been generated and used to cataloging robins. MODS, specifically for library applications, has been used to, to catalog robins for, by, for example, uh, the Harvard Library. CDWA is a set of cataloging rules for cultural works, including art, architectures, manuscript, manuscripts, paintings, photographs, prints, um, um, and uh, sculptures, etc. Besides the generic schemes, several specific metadata schemes were designed for robins. For example, metadata for robins, cataloging rules, um, describe a, sacred, a, a set of Chinese national standard cataloging rules for robins. The Institute of History and Philology of Academia Sinica in Taiwan developed a metadata scheme to describe its robin collection. Additionally, uh, several institutions use homegrown metadata schemes 
for Robin cataloging, for example, the British Museum, the Spurlock Museum, and the East Asian Library at the University of California, Berkeley. In this study, we present an overview and a comparative analysis of the metadata schemes of different Robin's collections. The purpose of the com comparison is to increase the awareness of different metadata schemes used to be cataloging, to catalog robins, enhance the understanding of the influence of different cultural backgrounds on the description of robins, enrich the existing comparative research of robins, contribute to a common rule of describing robin resources, and identify the important factors of, for robins data modeling. We designed a comparative guide to examine the structural and functional features of metadata schemes for robins. The elements are shown in this table. Um, here we can see a number of same module and the number of similar modules. Uh, same modules means that the modules have the same higher level category with the same subfields. We neglect the differences caused by translation or the different expressions of the same meanings. Um, similar modules are more complex than the same modules. It refers to different cases. Um, first, same higher level categories with different subfields. Second, different higher level categories with more than half the same subfields. We also neglect the differences caused by translation or different expressions of the same meanings. We adopted the relationship model of Chinese robins data designed in a previous study as another comparing scheme. Though the relationship model was designed based on the Chinese robins resources, the main elements are universal and the model can be extended to describe other types of robins. Um, here we can see the mm, model. This is a four level model. The first level works are intellectual or artistic creations. Objects are physical items with inscriptions and carvings of intellectual or artistic works. Since robin is a print technology, an object may be robbed repeatedly ha and have different copies of robins. Uh, digitized robins are the digital image of robins. We also adopted a six category typology of metadata, which was adjusted, adjusted from the Getty and the NISO typology including administrative, descriptive, preservation, technical, structural, and use metadata. So in our study, a total of seven metadata schemes were selected to do the comparison. Um, as I just mentioned, um, the Chinese standard and the Seneca scheme are special schemes designed for describing Chinese robins. The MET scheme, the British Museum scheme, the Spurlock Museum scheme, and the CTWA are general schemes for describing museum collections, including Chinese robins and brass robins. MODS covers various types of resources, including robins. Okay, next we're going to talk about um, general comparisons, specific comparisons, and the common features across schemes. Uh, the number of fields of each scheme varies a lot. Uh, you can see in this table, uh, CTWA with the most fields has 900, uh, 398 fields, while the MET scheme has only 54 fields. Um, the MET uh, scheme, uh, we harvested the MET scheme from its open source collection. The Seneca scheme has the most um, 60 top categories. And the structural statistics of these schemes are shown in table one. Next, um, table two shows the statistics corresponding to the relationship model. At the works level, um, yeah, at the works level, fields describing the subject title, and language are the most common fields. 
The granularity of works field varies a lot. For example, the Chinese standard has only one subject field, but MODS um, has um, 34 subfields and the British Museum scheme has 29. These subfields describe topic, geographic information, temporal information, genre, title, name, script language, associated resources, etc. At the object level, the schemes normally describe information about collection information, condition, curator, date, decoration, exfoliation, inscription, location, material, materials, etc. The Chinese standard has a specialized top category uh, named original object description describing the objects. The Seneca scheme has a group of top level categories to describe original objects and has several modules to describe certain types of objects. Fields at the robins level are the main body of the schemes. This part covers rich content, including information about condition, copyright, creation, credit, description, edition, exhibition, location, materials, measurements, um, provenance, title, related work, reference, seal, techniques, etc. At the digitized Robin level, the schemes commonly describe the image information, including copyright, date, format, measurement, numbers of images, um, photographers, related images, etc. Uh, table three shows the statistics of metadata types of each scheme. Most schemes do not cover all types of metadata and the fields are unevenly distributed across the types. Administrative and descriptive metadata constitute a major part of the schemes, while technical metadata constitutes the least part in general. In Seneca, the Seneca scheme embraces all types of fields, followed by the schemes of the British Museum, the Spurlock Museum, and CTWA, which comprises five types of metadata. The Chinese standard and the MET scheme include four and three types of metadata, respectively. The MODS fields used to catalog robins only cover administrative and descriptive metadata metadata, but uh, that is not the end story of MODS. We will talk about it later. Okay, besides the general comparisons, we did several specific comparisons. The first one is the comparison between the Chinese standard and the Seneca scheme. Since both, both schemes were designed for describing Chinese robins, they meet the special feature descriptions. For example, they both describe authentication of the objects, calligraphy features, creator with different roles, different titles of a robin, a mark on the robin including colorfuls and seals, serial robins, mounting format, etc. The two schemes have six similar modules. Uh, which are title, type, condition, copyright, exhibition, and version, and uh, technique as the same module. The main differences exist in reference description, marks description, and title descriptions. The two schemes have distinct, distinct numbers of subfields of the, these top categories. Generally speaking, the Seneca scheme is more structured and detailed than the Chinese standard. Both schemes overfit brass rubbings, which do not have the spatial features as the Chinese rubbings have. Next, um, we did a comparison within the museum scheme, including the Met scheme, the Spurlock um, scheme, the British Museum scheme, and the CTWA. These schemes were not designed for robbing specifically with the emphasis on the commonality of the museum connections. They are adequate for registering robbings with some information loss. 
the Spurlock scheme and CGWA has have two similar modules. Uh, the module describing physical features and the module describing exhibition information. The Spurlock, the Spurlock scheme only describes the robbings level and the digitized robbings level without disclosing subjects, origins, and the stories behind the robbings, which might be essential to understanding the robbings and their values. The MET schemes. Uh, the MET scheme has only two fields describing the works and the objects level. Compared to the compactness of the MET and the Spurlock schemes, the British Museum scheme and the CDWA are comprehensive in terms of the number, the number of fields and the coverage of levels. They are more granular and pay more attention to describing the objects and the works embodied in the objects. We also did a comparison between MOTS and CDWA. The representatives of the library schemes and the museum schemes. CDWA covers all four levels of relationship model while MOTS doesn't describe the digitized robbings level. It's interesting to see that Though the total number of fields of mods is less than one third of CDWA, it has more than twice the fields as CDWA to describe subject information. The majority of fields of CDWA, around 77% of the total, fall into the Robbins level category. As the typology, mods only covers administrative and descriptive metadata. We're Mm, descriptive metadata accounts for 90% of the total fields. Uh, CDWA includes more types of metadata like uh, administrative, uh, descriptive, preservation, uh, structural, and use metadata. MODS does not describe information like exhibition loan history, condition examining nation history, orientation, context information, etc that are described in CDWA. However, MOTS has a very strong field name, named extension, which theoretically can accommodate all any fields from any vocabularies, um, making MOTS extensive and inclusive to describe robins. For example, in the Chinese robins collections of Harvard Library, they borrowed the terms from CDWA light to describe the information that MODS itself cannot describe. So um, all the schemes have common fields um, of title, creator, identifier, measurement, technique, material, location, language, and subject, though they may use different terms. All the schemes have fields to link external resources. Um, these fields are related works, um, link resource, um, related item and reference to link um, different resources like artifacts, artworks, and bibliograph bibliographic materials. Um, the MET scheme and MODS support linking to any types of resources. Um, the linking fields of the MET scheme fit better in the linked open, uh, linked data context. Okay, let's wrap it up. Uh, we did a qualitative comparison study of seven metadata schemes used for describing Robbins resources. And they have different complexities and granularities, thus leading to various degrees of detail and different coverages. Uh, each scheme has its emphasis and focus and serves its main purpose. Uh, information loss or overfit of the schemes might happen when using different schemes because of the highly specific nature of some of the schemes. Um, last, uh, we acknowledge the sharing of the metadata schemes from Dr. Lok Yuping of the British Museum and Ms. Jennifer White of the Spurlock Museum. We also appreciate their willingness to share the details of the schemes uh, for research purposes. Mm, that's all. 
So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. Okay, so thank you, Lee. If not, we can finish here. Okay, so thank you very much for for the presentations, you four that did the presentations and also the audience for coming here. And hope to see you in another session. Thank you, Gemma, for moderating this session. Thank you for thank hosting. You. Yeah. Thank bye, you. Bye.